Great. Good. Well, welcome to the uh, final panel session of this conference on steering economic change. Uh, in some ways, I think the most important insight with which we began this whole inquiry was that contrary to all the stuff about how everything was changing all the time and all this precious instability, deep down, the structure of the British economy was not changing very much. If anything, changing less than in previous decades. That's why we called our interim report stagnation. And behind all the political change, the endless sh shifts in government, the changes in industrial strategy that we're hearing about on a, on a previous panel, the paradox is that the politics may be turbulent, but the underlying economic structure is surprisingly stuck. There might even be a link between those two phenomena, who knows? Well, we're going to investigate that with our panel now. We are going to hear in a moment from Gregory Thwaites, who is the research director at the Resolution Foundation. And we have a fantastic panel. Uh, we've got, of course, Martin Wolf, who is chief economics commentator of the Financial Times. He's written an excellent book, The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, which was going to be the title of our report, actually, until he nabbed it, and we had to settle for Economic Inquiry 2013 instead. Um, we've also got Professor David Edgerton, Professor of History at King's College in London, and Stephanie Flanders, Head of Economics and Politics at Bloomberg. Um, Greg, let's start with your okay. presentation. Over to you. Okay. Uh, so thanks very much, David. And thank you all for uh, making it this far. Um, you know, seven hours of charts is uh, pretty tough, but then on the other hand, like at this time of the year, when can you go seven hours without once hearing Mariah Carey? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to change that now. Right? So that was a, definitely some benefits. So Torsten showed you a little bit of ankle earlier, didn't he? About economic change. So, so we talked about getting growth up. Everyone knows what that means. Uh, that doesn't mean it's easy, but everyone knows what it means. We talked about getting inequality down. Again, that's very difficult, but everyone knows what it means. Now we're going to talk about steering change. So what does steering change mean? I'm going to give you the kind of the, the what of economic change. Then I'm going to give you the why of economic change. And then I'm going to give you the how, how of economic change. So economic change is industrial sectors of the economy uh, growing or shrinking, or it's firms growing or shrinking, or it's people, workers changing jobs. So you can think about it at the level of the sector, the level of the firm, and the level of the worker. And the first thing we need to do, now we've defined our terms, is get our facts straight. People talk a lot about economic change having accelerated, but in fact, that's not what's been happening. So I'm gonna show you this chart. This chart, you can see time on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is like the fraction of workers moving from one industry to another every year, roughly speaking. And you can see that however you measure industries, we're, we're at a, a multi-decade low. So there's less change, not more, going on in the economy. And that's the first thing we need to remember. I could also show you a chart about change at the level of firms. So I could show you that the, the rate at which firms are growing and shrinking has slowed down. People call that business dynamism. It's about a quarter down since the uh, global financial crisis. And I could also show you a chart at the worker level. So I could show you that workers are switching jobs less quickly than they used to. So however you think about it, change is slowing. But, but why do we care about that? The reason is that change is where growth comes from, by and large. Innovation, the growing of large firms, people starting new jobs, people starting new careers. That's where growth comes from, and it's good, by and large. It can be traumatic, but it's good. Let me give you one example here, one piece of evidence. You can see here uh, that lack of change is going to have real costs to, to people. At the bottom, you've got the, the average pay increase of all workers. And then you can see how much bigger your pay increase is if you change jobs. It's even bigger still if you change jobs and sectors or jobs and regions. So this is just one of several things I could show you to explain why change is important. OK, so we've done the what and we've done the why. Now let's do the how. So the first thing we're going to need to do is reshape the industrial composition of our economy in the right direction. This chart on the x-axis, uh, the, the, the width of the bars is, is how many people work in each of these sectors. And the height of the bars is how productive they are 
and that tends to be where all the money is as well in terms of pay, um, how productive they are uh, relative to the average. And you can see here that we've got some uh, really brilliant manufacturing, scientific and technical, ICT sectors, financial services, of course, um, on the right-hand side. And then we've got some very low productivity sectors, especially accommodation and food services, on, on the left-hand side. And the plan, basically, is we want to raise the average by shrinking those bars on the left and growing those bars on the right. That's going to bring the average up, right? How are we going to do that? First thing we talked about was effective large cities. So services happen in cities. Torsten told you that this morning. We need to power our cities up to get more space for this, more capacity for this, um, these, these bars on the right. Second thing, we need to have the right train strategy, which means um, finding a solution for our advanced manufacturing and then also taking the huge opportunities that we have from our um, services powerhouse status, world's second largest exporter of services, um, and using that to grow our export in services, so new services trade agreements. Last but not least, we're going to need to support investment. Um, in order to grow these sectors on the right, firms are going to have to grow, and that means investment. They're going to need the right skills, and that's going to mean investment in human capital, amongst other things. Okay, so I've, I've explained where the space is going to come for, from on the right-hand side. How are we going to get the resources out of the lower bars on the left-hand side? Not all of them, but some. There are some low-paid sectors, for example, like social care, which we really don't think should shrink. They probably need to grow. So this is another chart that Torsten showed you earlier today. And what these are, each dot is a country. And then on the x-axis, you've got how expensive leisure and hospitality is in that country. And on the y-axis, you've got how much of it we buy. And you can see you know, we're in the, the top left here. And, and, but the point is, as they become more expensive, people are going to consume less of them, right? So, so what we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to improve uh, in the strategy. It's about improving terms and conditions, uh, pay minima, um, and uh, as a result, possibly raising the relative price of some of these sectors like um, leisure and hospitality. And, you know, when we've been talking about the success of the minimum wage, we've been saying, well, how much of a cost of that can we bear but what, what we should do is we should not think of that as a bug, but as a feature, right? So what we're doing is we're making these things more expensive, not only to improve the conditions for the workers in, in those areas, but, but, but also to create capacity for the economy to grow in, in, in better sectors, more productive sectors. So making them more expensive is, isn't just going to make the economy bigger. We think it's going to make the economy fairer as well. So what this chart shows you is different quintiles of the income distribution. So we've got the lowest income on the left-hand side and the highest income on the right. The red bars is like how much of this stuff people spend their money on. And you can see those bars are going up. So the richer you get, the more that you spend on retail, leisure, and hospitality. I'm sure that accords with everybody's con conventional wisdom. And then again, the, the richer you are, the less you get your money from, from that sector. So if we make the thing more expensive, we'll be doing um, more for the incomes of the people on the left-hand side, and that money will be coming in part from more expensive services that the, the people on the right-hand side buy. So not only will it be good for the economy in terms of growth, it's, it's about sharing that growth as well. So that's sectors. Let me talk about firms. We're going to need to see faster change at the level of firms as well. What does that mean? In, in this case, um, that means firms growing and shrinking. In particular, productive firms growing and small firms shrinking. That's what we need to see. This chart shows you why we need to see that. This chart, the height of the bars is how productive firms are at different points in the distribution within a given sector. So I've chosen wholesale and retail trade here. So you've got very productive uh, retailers, let's say uh, Aldi or, or, or Asda on, in the, on the right-hand side, and you've got less productive retailers on the left-hand side. And we need to see the less one productive ones shrink, the more productive ones grow. That means more dynamism. How are we going to get that? We need to have more competitive uh, pressure from a more open economy. So that means lowering trade costs, especially with the European Union again, and these services trade agreements. It means uh, more investment uh, and you know, the business environment getting tougher for poor, poor performers. It means planning reform so that um, bigger firms can grow. They've got the land as well as the labor to grow. It means halving stamp duty, not just for workers and, and, and residential stamp duty, but also for firms, because stamp duty is a tax 
on assets changing hands, and therefore it's a tax on dynamism. We don't want to tax dynamism as much. Last but not least, the mantra needs to change from supporting small firms through lower taxes, for example, lower corporation taxes, um, lower uh, business rates, to supporting young and growing firms. So there are some small firms which are going to be great firms or really valuable ones, and, and then there are other small firms that don't really deserve special support from the government. So we want to go young, not small. Last but certainly not least, I'm not going to show you a chart, I'm going to show you some words. So we don't just do, um, we don't just crunch numbers at RF um, and on the Economy 2030 inquiry, we also listen to people. And what we've heard from people, we've asked them, why aren't you changing jobs more? You know there are better jobs out there, why aren't you changing jobs more? And you get a different picture at different points in the labour market. So we've asked people towards the bottom of the labour market, and they're really worried that if they move jobs, the, 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 the capital that they have with their um, employer to give them a little bit of flexibility on their hours or the, maybe a few more hours is going to be destroyed when they move jobs. So we want to give them the courage to move, the ability to move, by raising those minima. So we've done really well on the minimum wage. We need to raise the minimum for other things like sick pay uh, and so on. Right? At the top of the labour market, you get a very different story indeed because we've seen that these people tend to have um, more humane uh, hours and conditions and so on. What they're really worried about is the downside. There's, because they're closer to the top, they're worried about how far they can fall. And so we need to have a new system of unemployment insurance in this country um, to give uh, workers um, a, a larger fraction of their earnings if they become involuntarily unemployed for a bit longer than the very low replacement rates we see at the moment. And you can see here from this quote that that's what's going to be um, a thing that's going to get the labour market moving at the top. So different things at the bottom and different things at the top. So let me just wrap up. Um, it's time now that we need, to, we need to start worrying about there having been too little change, not too much. And I hope you know what, what we mean by that now. So our task is to raise the capacity um, for highly productivity, so fatter bars at the right-hand side, um, alongside relative price changes that lean against lower productive sectors, so more expensive things at the bottom to create capacity at the top. We need to remove barriers to change for firms, like I said, for example, start halving stamp duty. Um, and then we also need more empowered workers willing and able to take risks because flexibility is not the same as dynamism. We've focused too much so far on flexibility. What we need to see is more dynamism and more change, not less. And that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Craig. You can see in the Resolution Foundation we've got a bit of a thing about the hospitality sector. <laughs> Sorry about that, but it is a um, sector that always appears in our analysis of what change should mean. Now, we've got three fantastic uh, panellists now to comment on this, and I'm also hoping, so do keep the questions coming, to take one or two of questions from our online participants on Slido. But, Martin, let's start with you. Martin Wolf, your observations. Okay. Um, I've only got five minutes, and um, that's obviously ridiculous. And the, Terribly unfair. And, the, and so I'm going to make basically two completely different points, so they are related. The first, I don't want to discuss in detail the uh, Resolution Foundation's st basic strategy, uh, because I intend to write a couple of columns on that. But... <laughs> But it is really important to understand what it is and what it, how, how stripped down to its most basic. It is um, people in businesses like consulting, uh, accountancy, financial services and so forth will expand dramatically to supply the world market and in the process supply us with all the foreign exchange we need uh, to live off. And these will, of course, be populated and run and by entirely high-skilled graduates. They pretend they'll, some of them will be living in Manchester and Leeds. They won't. Uh, and, and these people will be taxed to the hilt and, uh, and both directly by the government and indirectly by pushing up dramatically the cost of labor-intensive services will be reduced by the unskilled people who will no longer have any participation directly or indirectly in international trade. And it is actually a model of the economy that you can imagine 
I personally am deeply skeptical that it works for nearly 70 million people. But that, that's really what I want to say on that central issue. It has one other very big problem, which is those labor-intensive, high-skilled labor centers, so I'm looking forward to the reply on this, have the basic characteristic, they have next to no economies of scale, and you don't invest much in them because the, um, the basic capital employed in these businesses is human capital. So you do invest in human capital, but otherwise, who the hell cares? It's not machine intensive. Now, it could become machine intensive, but then it becomes AI driven. And in that case, it's a commodity and it ceases to be a relevant sector from our future. That's my first point. And the second point is when I thought about what I meant by change, not what the Resolution Foundation means by change, I mean, and now it start off, well, we want faster economic growth, less inequality among households, less inequality among regions, and we want a green transition. And we want all these things to happen pretty damn quickly. And to do this, and this is more or less rephrasing, we promote high productivity and high productivity growth sectors. We pro promote high productivity and high productivity growth firms. We increase relative wages for low-wage people. We increase investment very substantially, both public and private. We increase savings because at the moment we already have a massive great current account deficit and how big can it get, um, which means less consumption, by the way. Uh, we increase innovation within and across sectors and, of course, we increase the supply of skilled people. And to do all that over any moderately, moderately brief ten, um, um, time frame, which is, say, 10 years, we have to change almost every policy system you can imagine. That's the truth, in my view. Um, and that then gets to the question, how do we steer this? I have absolutely no idea, but certainly not with the political and governmental system we have. And that's where the, the crucial point about the policy debate. I didn't hear Mr. Starmer, and this is my very last one, I didn't hear Mr. Starmer, but I think I have a pretty good guess of what, he's going, what he said. And the one thing I can say with absolute certainty is that what will happen under him will make no appreciable difference on the many fundamental issues that I've just raised, because we're not talking about small change, we're talking about really big changes. And the, uh, the system we run as politically, in terms of government, and I won't even go into the corporate sector and all the rest of it, is just not capable of this. And that's obvious. And if we don't recognize that reality, we're not gonna get any sort of change, steered or otherwise. Well, thank you very much, Martin. <laughs> um, we, uh, we look forward to the column, perhaps. Uh, I would just it's say... A terrific analysis. <laughs> By the well, way, the analysis is absolutely superb, and that's what makes it clear how big the cliff is yeah, that we have to climb. It is a very big challenge. Though I have to say, the analysis also tackles some of the issues you identify. I mean, I do if know. you look at what we show in our growth sectors that we do think, oh, well, we've got a comparative advantage, the evidence is that's where pay rises across the entire skills range. We've got a chart showing that. We even have a chart showing what happens to the price of hairdressing, and that shows how thorough we are at Resolution Foundation. But if you go to figure 58, you'll find some of part of the answer to Martin's very telling challenges. Now we're going to hear from... So because these people buy all those services. Uh, yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, indeed. Absolutely. Uh, now we're going to hear from Professor Edgerton. Of course, David has written The Rise and Fall of the British Nation. Before that, he's written on, I think, an incredibly astute analysis of the changing shape of the British state, the warfare state uh, from 1920 to 1970, and perhaps most relevant to our theme today, uh, a book with a brilliant title, The Shock of the Old, reminding us how much some of these old structures and arrangements hang around. So, David, we're very interested in your observations. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let, let me start by saying that I, I, I agree with, uh, with Martin that the, the changes that, uh, that, that are implied are really radical. 
Uh, but those, those changes sometimes do happen, even in British history. And uh, they particularly happened in, in the years 1945 to the mid-1970s, years which conventionally regarded as, as years of uh, poor performance, even of uh, decline. But these are the years of the highest ever rates of economic growth in British history, the highest ever rates of productivity growth in British history. They are years of uh, increasing equality, uh, between uh, incomes, between uh, levels of wealth, and between uh, regions. It's an extraordinary uh, success story. Uh, perhaps we should think about um, emulating that success. Uh, we also had higher R&D spend. We had an extraordinary successful uh, energy uh, transition as well. What's not to like? Well, we don't like it at all. These are the years of uh, stupor we heard yesterday. Yeah? These are the years when um, the Labour Party was uh, in office for a long time. And supposedly this Labour Party was interested in taxing and spending. Well, actually the Labour Party was a productivist party. It liked nothing better than uh, transforming the supply side of the uh, economy. Uh, and in fact, it finds echoes in, in what we've heard uh, today. In the 1960s, there was something called the Selective Employment Tax, which was about taking people out of low productivity services and encouraging their deployment in high productivity um, uh, uh, manufacturing. There was also um, great interest in making uh, changes between jobs easier. Redundancy Payments Act, 1965. Hardly anyone knows about this, but extremely important. Yeah? Uh, so, the, uh, so, so these years were years of real change, and uh, Gregory showed us the, the structural change um, uh, uh, data. Extraordinary structural change uh, between the 30s and 1950. Uh, reasonably strong in, in the 50s and 60s. The 1970s, that decade we all love to hate. Extraordinary rates of structural change uh, long before uh, Margaret uh, Thatcher. So, um, back to the future, uh, perhaps. Back to um, uh, taking, taking our, our, our past a, a little more, uh, uh, more uh, seriously. Um, what are the implications of, of that, that point? Well, I think we need a, a richer, uh, more honest conversation, to quote somebody from uh, uh, earlier uh, today, about what has happened since. And what has happened since is a, a decrease <laughs> in all the things that we want to increase, including rates of economic growth. And I think we need to take that very seriously. Now, it's not the case that um, uh, we simply... Uh, in, in, a, in a changed overall world. <coughs> the UK's position uh, in, in productivity relative to France and Germany, as a wonderful chart uh, shows, if I've read it, uh, uh, um, eyeballed it uh, uh, correctly. If you take the worst years of the 1970s, um, uh, uh, not the best one, the worst years of the 1970s in terms of relatively low British productivity, uh, essentially the story has remained the same in terms of comparative productivity to this day, with the exception of a period in the early noughties, which I think was a bit exceptional. In other words, there is absolutely no reversal of the British decline uh, compared to France and Germany. And of, and of course, uh, there never, was never going to be any chance of reversing the decline compared to China and India, indeed, to the rest of, um, of the of the of the world. So we need to understand what has happened to the British uh, uh, economy. Now, a very common way of thinking about what has happened is to say uh, uh, short-termism. Uh, sticking plaster politics. But I think this is very inadequate. Um, it's true that, it, well, it, 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 it is certainly the case that in the years 1945 to the 70s, there was a lot of long-termism building new coal mines, motorways, railways, electricity generation systems, and so on. But since 1979, we've also had an extraordinary long-termist set of programs. It's just that we, many people, and perhaps the majority in this room, didn't like them. Yeah? 
But we've had the deliberate pushing down of the replacement ratios of unemployment benefits. It didn't happen by accident or with people short term. No, no, we're, we're going to take it down from 30 to 15 percent. Um, uh, there's been a deliberate pushing down of public investment. Again, it didn't. And there's been a bit of volatility recently, but the trend is is very clear. And that's that was a long, long term program. Uh, and uh, Brexit. Uh, that wasn't a quick fix for anything. That was a very long-term program which people devoted many, many years of their, uh, their, their lives to and, and are pushing through. So what we've got to think about is the actual policies uh, and how they've impacted over, over time and to uh, stop thinking in cliches. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one, I have to say, this is a, a, a wonderful uh, report uh, both for what is in it and what is not in it. And I'll, I'll end on, 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 on this point. It's so pleasing to see a report that doesn't go on and on about manufacturing, that it doesn't go on and on about the UK being an innovation science uh, superpower, that we need more small uh, uh, businesses, that we need AI, that, um, that, we, that we really you know, are going to uh, be the innovation hub of uh, the world. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. There's a real recognition here that the UK is not a superpower by any measure at all, except perhaps legal services, uh, uh, libel services perhaps. Uh, uh, it, it represents 2% of world R&D, very roughly 2% of manufacturing. Yeah. That's not insignificant, but it's not superpower stuff. There's a wonderful recognition, therefore. That's not the way forward, and I think that is a major change from the, from the discourse both of the Labour Party and, indeed, of the Conservative uh, uh, Party. And there's a very welcome emphasis on, effectively, imitation uh, on catch-up. Yeah? It's an invitation, which I think we should all uh, take up wholeheartedly, for modesty, for recognising that the great number of our fellow citizens are having a miserable time and that we need a politics of improvement rather than a politics of grandi grandiloquence. But I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much uh, indeed, David. And that's a very interesting contrast, a reminder that indeed it is about catching up with um, some of comp some comparator countries. Now, Stephanie, Stephanie Flanders, head of economics and government at Bloomberg, has been a shrewd observer of this changing <laughs> scene for a long time, including when she was at the BBC. Stephanie, your take on all this? Uh, well, I was kind of struck. I thought this panel was a really good idea because you've had all of these kind of highfalutin theory about how to make things, how to make change, you know, how, what needs to happen. And then there was going to be the nuts and bolts of forcing change on the ground, uh, with no disrespect to my colleagues, from two economic commentators and a historian. So I'm not sure whether, as Martin said, I'm not sure we really know how to force change um, on the ground. But I share, obviously, Martin's, since I have been around for so long, as David points out, I share that... Uh, <laughs> um, I share the sort of deep understanding of the path dependence of these things. And mm -hmm. it is also interesting to yeah. remember the 70s. And I was quite struck, actually, at the investment summit. Rishi Sunak's very much um, talked about for at least half an hour. Uh, investment summit last week, you, had work, you did have uh, global business leaders of very high caliber, all in London, all praising the UK all day. But I promise you, all they praised all day were the same three things, the time zone, the language, and English common law. Mm -hmm. So those are still the things that we've got, and thank goodness, they are still massive advantages. We still have a lot of people wanting to come to Britain, but it, that is path dependency for you. I mean, we've had those for quite a long time. Um, and even you could say that the rule of law has been a little bit you know, challenged at various times recently. Um, we spent all day talking about investment. How do you force investment? You know, I think we've got some quite practical ideas about that. 
Um, I like just in passing an idea of in, about protecting investment the way you protect the NHS, and I think that speaks to sort of having a conversation and having some slogans around investment. But I do think you also, we would then have to be honest about what most of that investment is. It's maintenance. It's not actually exciting investment in new things, public investment. It's stopping mm. things from falling down and getting rid of holes in things. And I think that actually might concentrate minds and make people support it a bit more. Um, the focus on dynamism and the lack of it is obviously really um, important. And within that, certainly what's come through in a lot of productivity research, as we know, in the UK, is this lack of diffusion. And you see it a lot in, in the report, you know, the wide range, you know, just getting people even not necessarily even to best practice, but just halfway to best practice could have this enormous um, difference. How, I'm not sure we have, even the distinguished people in the audience, I'm not sure that we've got that many great examples of increasing diffusion when you've kind of set out to do it. Um, but I think probably just reducing barriers to dynamism. If you can't change what Britain is and you can't really change the whole structure of government, just reducing what's holding people back is probably a good start. And I would certainly endorse many of the things in the report, sort of basic things that I thought, I feel like I would learn when I was at the Institute for Fiscal Studies many years ago in 1992. Uh, that Was it that long ago? Something like that. Um, you know, you don't want to have a tax code that actually encourages small, not very successful businesses to remain mm. unsuccessful and small. And yet we're still sort of doing that and choosing to do that a lot. So I think that's, a, that's an important uh, point around that. Um, another big obstacle post-Brexit is Brexit for a lot of these businesses. And I enjoyed the, engage the sort of Zanny's question to the leader of the opposition about seizing the opportunities of Brexit. Of course, one opportunity you have after you've left the EU that you didn't have before is to really bring quite a lot of advantages to the economy by getting a much better deal with Europe than you had mm -hmm. before. Um, and I sort of, I don't think you have to read very far between the lines in this report to see a sort of Theresa May's backstop, anyone? Mm -hmm. Um, that the Labour Party didn't vote for, for probably lots of good reasons, but that's kind of what you're talking about when you talk about a much closer arrangement that effectively gives up some sovereignty with the good sector, but reduces some of those obstacles. <coughs> and it's interesting that that wouldn't violate any of the promises not to go into a customs union and not to go into a single market, at least not technically violate those things. Um, and finally, um, and the thing that I do know a bit about having worked with um, some city leaders uh, on these issues is, you know, I think one, one, way to, one way to sort of feel our way on some of this, whether it's about spreading innovation or just being, being more dynamic, helping change happen, um, is by being really serious about that place-based strategy and the city's sort of mission for cities. And that isn't just about sort of focusing on the mayors or having Andy Burnham on the Today programme more often. Um, I actually, I sort of basically agree with um, Tom, Tom Riordan, who was uh, speaking in the earlier panel, um, who said, you know, this can't be done from Whitehall. I think the only amendment I would say to that is that you can't be done without Whitehall. You know, this can't be about just decentralising a bit of discrete power to cities. It's about what Jim O'Neill used to talk about, about many years ago, sort of having Team Birmingham, Team Manchester sitting in Whitehall. I don't even agree with Andy Holday that it should be in Darlington. I think you need a much closer, um, and I don't know what that would look like. I don't think it's necessarily a separate minister or a separate ministry, but having teams in Whitehall who are working with cities, their own city, thinking about getting to know what's going on in that city and thinking about what the kind of unexpected obstacles are that come from lots of different policies operating together. And it may not even be the sort of traditional growth policies that they don't have very much control over, you know, the 70 funding streams that actually are operating in relation to growth policies in, say, Manchester or, or Birmingham. I was talking to a, um, the leader of a, of a northern, uh, one of the larger northern councils the other day, and discovered something I didn't know, which they, they increasingly get a lot of very troubled children sent to them from the southeast 
who cost upwards of £1 million to look after. And they're sent up from, from London because obviously it's, you know, they don't have the resources or it's too expensive to have this very kind of labour-intensive support for these individual... This is not disabled children. This is, this is children who need constant safeguarding and mental support and other things. They sometimes have a team of four or five people working for them almost round the clock. Um, and those are... There's a lot of set of incentives that have encouraged that to happen and are in, putting an enormous burden on those councils. And I don't think anyone in Whitehall quite realises it's happening. And it's taking up a lot of their mental capacity as well. And I just think it's a sort of random example, but something like that, which doesn't even necessarily affect growth, is affecting the ability of those people in that council to focus on helping businesses, helping workers. So whatever we can do, if I, I cooked up with Tom Rawdon earlier, we could maybe, I think one of the things you could do is have much more interplay. None of us could think of a senior local government official who is now working mm. in Whitehall. Someone who's had a senior job running a city, actually maybe forcing them to then spend a year in Whitehall. There's my little plan, a little, you know, I'm sorry, Tom, you want to stop mm. being chief executive of Leeds, you're going to have to spend a year in in Westminster, or, or at least have, or have a sort of mentor schemes, but something along those lines to just begin on that road that Martin talked about, of like changing the way we think about policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and I must say, alongside all the, the wonderful resolution analysis we've had during the conference today, Tom's point that he needed to get Whitehall clearance to build a roundabout it was, I thought, one of the most vivid facts that brought home some of the problems we face. And look, we have been trying in our report to be absolutely realistic. We're analysing revealed comparative advantage. We're not inventing things we think we're good at. We're trying to discern from all the evidence what the evidence suggests we're already good at. And your point about the English language and time zones and everything, absolutely time with that. So I think... There's the, I've just been looking at the Slido questions, and there's a, there's a Slido question that has come up from, at several points during the day, which is about uh, where, exactly where the, green, the climate emergency and green growth fits into this. It was a point on which, of course, Keir Starmer was challenged because of the $28 billion. There are some people who are putting in questions just saying, how does this tie in with the overwhelming challenge of uh, the, the state of the environment. So I don't know um, whether, Greg, you want to make a comment on how that ties in with our analysis, please. I, I think uh, net zero runs throughout the report, uh, and what we're saying on net zero is that it's, it's a necessary thing, but it's not going to be a drag on the economy. Uh, on the contrary, it should help, but it, nor will it be kind of transformatively good for the economy. Um, uh, where it fits into change is uh, that I don't expect it, uh, outside of a few um, sectors, to make sectors grow or, or shrink a great deal. What will happen is that some firms and will grow and others will shrink. Um, if you think about um, uh, car mechanics, for example, so electric cars just go, they don't break as much as uh, petrol cars, so the, we're going to need to have fewer car mechanics and their, their training is going to have to be different. Um, in terms of construction, of course, people are going to have to learn to use new materials and techniques, uh, but I don't expect it to lead to transformative change um, beyond, beyond those sectors, however necessary it is. Um, there may be also some changes in economic geography, so um, you know, if we have a, a better offshore wind industry than we do now, and perhaps a more domestic one, um, you know, there, are, there are some places uh, in the country that can benefit from that. And Martin? Yeah, I largely agree with that from my reading on this. It's something I follow quite closely. But there is one pretty important caveat, um, which is, is going to take a hell of a lot of investment uh, in the uh, medium term. Um, just to give one example, which is a pretty obvious one, which we have tried not to think about, is the retrofitting of our entire housing stock with a different heating system. Mm -hmm. This will be disruptive and expensive. So the way to think about it is, to, is I think that whatever its long-term growth effects are, will be, I suspect, pretty close to zero over a long term from what I've seen, it's going to re require very substantial long-term increases in investment over something like a decade at the least 
First of all, it's going to be fantastically unpopular. We haven't even begun to think how unpopular it will be. I've been thinking about what it will mean for my own home and trying to persuade my beloved wife to accept the complete destruction of the interior decoration to allow it. Uh, it's, but the more important point is we are, a, as I've made the one thing we don't want to, we are a colossally savings short economy. Average savings rate is 13% of GDP. We have a, we have a structural current account deficit of about 4 or 5% of GDP. If we're going to raise investment rate, let's say just by one or two percentage points of GDP, that increases the external deficit by 50%. Where are we, how are we going to fund this? Uh, and the, this basic refusal in any of our discussions to face absolutely binding macroeconomic constraints, or at least I think they're binding, is very dispiriting, and it applies here too. We are going to have to pay for this yeah. Yeah. in the medium term. It is absolutely a high investment and also high savings strategy. And I don't know if, if Stephanie wants to comment, and then, and then David. Stephanie. I mean, Mar Martin's made the, r the right points. I think it's... But there is a bit of a debate about this, about the politics of it, that, you know, in these kind of circles, we tend to say, you know, you have to make clear it's not about, it's, it, you're going to increase investment and that means reduce consumption. You shouldn't sort of kid people that there's going to be lots of growth coming out of this. I sort of wonder, you probably do need to kid people a bit on that <laughs> front. And, and actually, that's why it's really important, this thing about it's about jobs. I mean... I, Ed Miliband has actually focused on this yeah. in a good way, the proportion of jobs in our renewable sector that are actually all just people making wind farms abroad, and then you have a few people who ferry them out, and then there's a very nice, you know, it has produced a lot of jobs, the servicing of the off offshore things. I've met some of those people, but, you know, I think that is why, if you're going to have that slight deceit or at least you know being economical with that aspect of like we're going to shift from a really high consumption to much less consumption which I think is fine not to talk about that much um, you have to at least be making yeah. sure that there are domestic jobs and that's where you get into the retrofitting yeah. again. And David do you, do you want to comment on this because of course it was interesting with your historical perspective that the you know, the three leaders that Keir Starmer was citing um, Attlee and Margaret Thatcher certainly both of them got elected, and for the first few years of Margaret Thatcher and a lot of Clement Attlee's time, on a message about sacrifice, pain, necessary to go through this in order to achieve something better. And you've just been talking about um, previous long-term patient strategies. Do you think they are possible? Oh, yes. Um, but the question is, the sacrifice for whom? Isn't it? Uh, and those, uh, those two, two leaders had very different groups uh, uh, in, 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 in mind. Uh, and they also both had a, a message not just about uh, who they were in favor of, who they were against. Um, I mean, Attlee was very much against selfish individualism, for, uh, uh, for example, and for the national interest. But these changes are, 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 are possible. But the, the thing I'd add to the, the, uh, what's, what's been said about, about climate change is that it's not just a question of money, it's also a question of planning and, <coughs> and political consent. Uh, and local authorities and central government will have to have a, a, a serious plan. And we're a long way from thinking about that. And that as, a, as a substitute for that, we have this, this sense that what needs to be done is to, is to, is to create a new manufacturing industry and, and new innovations. The reality is that we're going to be uh, insulating houses with very old technology. We'll be installing heat pumps, which have been themselves around for, for a very long time. We are not going to be... Um, uh, 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 generating huge quantities of uh, carbon neutral jet fuel and uh, 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 nor are we going to generating lots of nuclear electricity and we're certainly not going to be building many British wind turbines between now and, uh, and, 20, and 2030 so the, the, the focus needs to be on um, on, on the domestic, on, 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 on services of one, of one sort or, or, or the other, and just getting basic things done properly. Um, and I, I do fear that, uh, as, in, as has been the case for, for, for a long time, an emphasis on innovation is an excuse, actually, for, for doing nothing. Thank you very much indeed. I'm now just going to end this panel session with what may be the final resolution foundation chart of the day. Um, and this is 
Um, this, I think, is why the strategy is credible. You've heard already we're not trying to invent a different world. We're trying to understand what Britain is good at. We're also trying to shape a catch-up strategy. And what this slide is about is just what it would mean if we caught up with Australia, Canada, France, Germany, the Netherlands. First of all, if we just match their economic performance in terms of uh, achieving their levels of growth. Secondly, if, they, if we match their pattern of income distribution, uh, which would show then a group of losers at the high end of the income scale in the UK. Uh, and I sometimes think one reason why this radical debate doesn't quite happen, as way that our panelists have called for, is that when the top 10 or 20% of your income range are protected from the consequences <coughs> of being an underperforming economy, by enjoying living standards that match those of France and Germany, mm -hmm. and all the adjustment borne by the less affluent half, that does also skew your political debate as well. Mm -hmm. So the, the, middle slide, the middle part of the slide is about what happens if you just shifted to the kind of income distribution they have, and the, th and the third part is what happens if you achieve both. So we are simply saying, ma imagine that we achieve the economic performance and the pattern of income distribution of those countries, uh, and it shows that there are uh, significant gains, obviously above all for the less affluent half of the population, but actually for all of us, by a pure catch-up strategy, simply saying we've got to match what other countries we're very familiar with achieve already. So I'm very grateful to our panel for their wise observations, and we all look forward to Martin's columns. Thank you very much.